to, to be speaking to so many people who are interested in both geometry and gravity and not just one of them. So I'll try to take both perspectives. I should say first though that I'm a mathematician by training mostly, so my perspective will be mostly mathematical, but I'll try to give the physical intuition behind the notions as well, as well as I can. Okay? Um, the topic I'll be speaking about sounds rather old. If you look at the second, uh, these are the main references. I wrote them down already. So if you look at the overview book from, is from 1996, and then the next overview article is, is celebrating four decades of black hole uniqueness theorems. So they're an old topic. However, recently, not only, there have been many interesting uh, generalizations and also different methods of proofs. Some of them I will mention at the end. So it's, again, a hot topic. So I thought it would be a good topic. It's old, so there are rather basic things you can say, but it's also current, and you can do research right away at the end of the lecture series, if you like. Um, of course, these are not the only references I'll use. Most other references I will use, if they're about older stuff, are in there, so I'll just mention names and years. If I mention references that are not in either of these works, I will, in fact, write them down properly along the way, okay? Um, I will also produce lecture notes eventually, but I just had a small baby, so please allow this to take for a while. <laughs> um, so this is the plan of the class. Uh, in lecture one, which is today, we will talk about static space-times and introduce all the important notions, important being defined as we will need them in the, in the course of the lectures, not they're important generally, or not things we don't talk about are not important. Um, so this is a very brief introduction. Then in lecture two, we will talk about static vacuum, like hole uniqueness. And then in lecture three, we will again talk about static vacuum, black hole uniqueness but looking at different types of proofs. And then in lecture four, we're gonna talk about generalizations. In particular, to higher dimensions. And to photon surfaces. And I don't expect anybody to know what a photon surface is by now. I'll explain that in the last lecture. So that's the plan. And I presume you've already seen the, the Schwarzschild space-time many times, probably in every lecture. So I decided I'll write it down once so that you get used to my notation. And then I'm using it as an example, but I embed it into a larger class of examples. So those who are very familiar with Schwarzschild don't get bored and maybe learn something new. If you're not very familiar, just always imagine the example I'm tracking through to be just Schwarzschild, okay? <clears throat> so Schwarzschild space time. can be written as the Lorentzian metric ds squared of the form minus a function n squared dt squared plus one over n squared dr squared plus r squared d omega squared on the manifold r containing the time coordinate t cross some interval um, maximum of zero to m 
infinity cross S2. And this contains the radial variable R. And this d omega squared is the canonical metric on S2. Okay. With the function n being a function only of the radial coordinate r given by the square root of 1 minus 2m over r, and m in r is the mass. Okay, so this you've probably seen a lot, but I've written it in a general form, and we are now going to look at um, space times which have this form for various different functions of n. Okay. But let's first recall that the Schwarzschild space time models a vacuum space time in four dimensions, um, exterior region of a black hole, as you've probably heard, um, and it's of course spherically symmetric, and I wouldn't be talking about it if it wouldn't be static. Static by now for us only intuitively means that nothing moves. We'll define it more properly later. Pardon? In the bracket, the max of zero and two m. Okay? Because you need the square root to be well defined. So you can't R have, have R less than zero or zero, and you need two m. You need it to be larger than two m if two m is positive. Zero. And this is an infinity. So if m is positive, this is the exterior region of a black hole. If m is zero, this is a weird way of writing Euclidean, uh, the Minkowski space-time. And if m is negative, so this is weird altogether. But it's still a well-defined space-time. Um, it's a special case of the curve family that I'm sure you've seen. If, if you pick the angular parameter, a equals zero. And that's most I'm going to say. The, if m is bigger than zero, then the black hole horizon is at r equals 2m. So that's the threshold where this function becomes zero. And notice immediately that r equals 2m is not inside the manifold. So it's on the boundary of this manifold because this is an open interval. That's important because we want this function here to be positive. Okay? We'll see this occurring again and again. Um, Okay, and we will encounter metrics of this form more generally, and I'll, I'll give you some examples. But before I give you examples, let me fix notation or conventions and say that we have the gravitational constant and the speed of light set equal to one, which I think probably most lecturers are doing here. So, more examples of this form. Are what is called the Schwarzschild space times in higher dimensions, or sometimes called the Tangelini space times, or sometimes called Schwarzschild Tangelini. For N. We get the no equal to three. We can write the function n of r as the square root of one minus two m over r to the power n minus two. This is also positive. For r bigger than zero and bigger than the one over n minus two root of two m, depending if m is positive. And this, in fact, is just a natural generalization of the Schwarzschild space time to higher dimensions. It's also vacuum, it also has a black hole at this threshold if m is positive. Yeah? If you're a physicist and you're wondering about the units here, of course you would need to have an r over some reference length to make sense of this, and a mass over some reference mass. Um, but we'll not bother about units here. And the manifold on which this lives is r for the time, and then, again, this interval max, or rather, 0 or 2m. 
um, if M is non-positive or if M is positive to infinity and then cross S N minus two. And then the omega squared becomes the canonical metric on S N minus two of volume one. Um, there is also a metric in the literature that sometimes has the name pseudo Schwarzschild that we're not gonna talk about very much, but I want to mention it because it has confused some of my students enormously, which is for n equals two, so that's three space-time dimensions. n is always the spatial dimension for me. That's three space-time dimensions, and you take n of r is exactly as in the three-dimensional case. Of course, this is positive for being a zero and two m. Okay, so this gives you a legitimate space-time. However, this space-time is not vacuum. It doesn't satisfy the dominant energy condition, if you heard about that. It has no, besides looking exactly like three, three plus one dimensional Schwarzschild, it has no physical relevance within general relativity. I don't know about other theories. Okay, not vacuum. Um, I'll talk about it a little in the last class. So um, what it does do, it is, except being vacuum and not being asymptotically flat, that's something we'll talk about later as well. Um, it has all the properties of a Schwarzschild black hole. So if M is positive, it has a black hole horizon, just in the same way, yes? Yes. Yeah, that's a very good observation. So if I wanted to use this formula, it would be a typo, right? The power of? Oh, here. Oh, yeah, right, thanks. Sorry, I thought you meant the power here. Um, so the power here is actually really what's written down because you can't use this power and plug in n equals two. So this metric otherwise is exactly like Schwarzschild. It has a black hole horizon, it's vertically symmetric, and it has nice properties, but it doesn't satisfy the vacuum Einstein equations and it's not asymptotically flat. So another space-time you might have con uh, come across that has this form is the Reisner nordstrom electrically charged space-time. And we'll very briefly touch on that by the, in the last class. And in that space-time there's a mass M And a charge Q, think of an electric charge. Um, and then the function N can be written as one minus two M over R plus Q squared over R squared. Also positive for suitable R. Okay. This is again N equals three and there's a higher dimensional analog of this as well. And then there are lots of other examples and one relating to the class uh, you're following on the ADS CFT correspondence is a, me is a metric called the ADS Schwarzschild or the Kotler metric. I won't write it down because it requires to put too much notation, I just write its name down. 
And they also exist in all dimensions, bigger than or equal to three. So this is a, it's a huge class of examples. Um, if you don't put any um, partial differential equations imposing, any Einstein equations imposing matter. And all of them are static, spherically symmetric, and have other nice properties that we'll discuss in a second. So they'll all be examples for the static um, space times we may be talking about, we will be talking about later. So properties. They're static, and we will define later what this means. Obviously, it's very symmetric. If n goes to 0, as r goes to the r star of r in r star infinity, which I hope is suggestive enough to be self-explanatory um, in a suitably regular way. Then there is a black hole horizon at r star. We will define that later as well. The asymptotic behavior, and you've heard a lot about that, I presume, in Rick Shane's lecture, can be specified just by specifying the asymptotics of this function n, because n is the only free function in this metric. Okay. So that's why they're good toy models. So if r goes to infinity, we can prescribe, this is a question mark, what n does, for example, if we want to be asymptotic to Minkowski, we want n to go to 1, because if we plug in the function n equals 1, we get the Minkowski spacetime. If we want the manifold and the, st the spacetime to be asymptotic to the Schwarzschild spacetime, we will request that it asymptotically behaves like the Schwarzschild spacetime, so like this function n, as r goes to infinity plus lower order terms that we need to be precise how fast they decay, and I will not be precise on this except in the statement of theorems. Okay? If we wanted to say we are asymptotically anti de Sitter, like in the last example I didn't even write down, we would impose other asymptotic conditions on this function n. Okay? Um, good. Another property they have is that their spatial part. G being defined as 1 on n squared dr squared plus r squared d omega squared is the same for every t. Yeah? It doesn't depend on t. That's one of the consequences of, of being static. Is t independent? And also, the second fundamental, so, so g of t is the same g for all t. And the second fundamental form, which I don't know by k, of t is 0 for all t. 
which we will call time symmetric. Rick Shane may have mentioned that also. So from the, I'll draw a sketch in a second. sketch. Here's time. And then for each t, the set t equals constant in this manifold that I just erased. Um, looks exactly the same from its intrinsic geometry perspective and looks completely flat from its ex exterior perspective, which is why I'm drawing planes. Of course, intrinsically, they're not flat, but there's not enough room in the blackboard to indicate that. Um, okay. And if you look at the Einstein equation that you've seen many times, I presume, so the Vici of ds squared minus 1 half the scalar curvature of ds squared times ds squared is 8 pi t, where t is the energy momentum tensor, reduces to ODEs for, so to ordinary differential equations for the function n and the components of the energy momentum. because everything only depends on the variable r. That's why they become ordinary differential equations instead of partial differential equations because of the spherical symmetry and the staticity. And so if you want to do exercises, then your exercise one could be compute those ODEs. Just to get more familiar with this class of examples. There's one more property that I want to discuss because it will be very important in one of the, or several of the proofs of static black hole uniqueness, and that is conformal flatness, okay? And this is a confusing topic. I, I'll write down the form of the metric again. Just so you can see it. So of course, unless, <laughs> sorry, this is Minkowski space, this is not flat, yeah? It's also not conformally flat in general, or actually in, in very few cases it will be conformally flat. If you don't know what the notion of conformal flatness means, uh, please look it up as another exercise. I'll, I'll just give an intuitive explanation in a second. And it, it's very well explained on, on Wikipedia. So conformal transformations and conformal flatness. So intuitively, what it means that two spacetimes or two other Riemannian manifolds are conformally related or can be conformally transformed into each other is it means that at each point, if you pick two vectors in the tangent space and put them into the other manifold with the diffeomorphism, the angle remains the same. An isometry would also imply that the length of both vectors stay the same. For conformal transformation, we only require that the angle remains the same. Okay? And this conformal flatness then means you're conformal to flat space or flat space time, depending on context, where flat space time would be Minkowski and flat space would be Euclidean space of the corresponding dimension. Okay, so 
what I'm going to write now is that these metrics typically are what is called spatially conformably flat. Which means that the metric G, which is this spatial metric here on any of these fixed slices, can be written as a function phi to the power 4 over n minus 2. That's the dimensional convention. And of course, we need to stay away from 2 to write this down even, times the Euclidean metric. So delta is my Euclidean metric, and phi is a function is a function on, on um, say, t equals 0. Okay. So they're conformally flat, but only at each instant of time. So each of these extrinsically flat, intrinsically curved time slices is intrinsically conformally flat. It's curved, but it's conformally flat. So the angles are such that it could be flat. The lengths could be different. Okay, this is true for Schwarzschild. This is true for Schwarzschild in higher dimensions, and I'll write down some details in a second. And I'll say it again because it happens so frequently. This is not to be confused with the whole space-time being conformal to Minkowski space-time, because then there wouldn't be the causality theory for Minkowski and for these space-times would be exactly the same, and this would be very boring. Just the spatial slices. Example, Schwarzschild for m bigger than 0 and n equals 3. We can write the metric either, as we've done before, as 1 minus 2m over r dr squared plus r squared d omega squared or as 1 plus m over 2s to the power 4 delta, or if we spell out the Euclidean metric in spherical polar coordinates, as ds squared plus s squared to omega, where here we needed that r is bigger than 2m, and here we need that s is bigger than m over 2, um, to correspond to the same region. <coughs> and the coordinate transformation reads r is 1 plus m over 2s squared s. As you can see, if you compare the coefficients of d omega squared. Okay? So we've never seen this way of writing Schwarzschild in different coordinates, the angular coordinates say the same, just the radial coordinates transforms because we wanted to preserve the angles anyway, yeah? If you've never seen this, I recommend you to do this computation once to, to believe this. That would be exercise three, verify. If you have seen this and you're curious, you could try to come up with what needs to be here in higher dimensional Schwarzschild. Okay. If you have seen this way of writing Schwarzschild, the spatial part of Schwarzschild, you've probably seen it with the variable called r here as well, which creates also a lot of mistakes in the literature. So I'll, I'll try to be super consistent, and if I write it this way, I'll always try to call the radius s. Okay, the, in these coordinates, they're called Schwarzschild coordinates because they're the coordinates in which this was originally discovered by Schwarzschild. So Schwarzschild coordinates. And 
And on this side, the coordinates are called isotropic coordinates because they make the metric look isotropic. And again, this only applies to the spatial part of the metric. Okay, you can do the same thing for positive mass, higher dimensional Schwarzschild. Of course, you can do it in all dimensions bigger than or equal to three, also for zero M, but then nothing happens. For negative M, you can also do it in a neighborhood of infinity, but not all the way down to R equals zero, because your transformation breaks down at some point. The phi in this formula will start being negative, and then this makes no sense. Okay, so in, in, that's why I'm saying here that they typically are spatially conformally flat, meaning a lot of them are locally conformally flat, spatially conformally flat near infinity, and then again on re in regions, but they can be lines of R where they're not. Okay, also reisner nordstrom has this property of being spatially conformally flat um, with a nice transformation globally if the mass and the charge satisfy suitable conditions called sub-extremality, and otherwise regions of reisner nordstrom and higher dimensional reisner nordstrom will be spatially conformally flat. Same for ADS Schwarzschild, it will be a spatially conformally ADS. Okay, so this is important. And one more important thing here is this threshold. Then it'll get a little color. Well, here, the radius threshold 2m needs to be there because otherwise the formula stop making sense. This cutoff here at m over 2 doesn't need to be there at all in order for this formula to make sense. And in fact, we can just allow s bigger than 0 and say this gives a well-defined smooth metric spatial metric for s bigger than zero. So on either whatever you want, R3 without the origin or zero infinity cross S2, whichever way you prefer to write it. Okay, so this way of writing the Schwarzschild spatial slice metric allows you to extend the spatial slice beyond where we can look before, and then the surface, the two surface in this three space time, in this three space sitting here, any two surface sitting inside here can actually, um, sorry, what did I want to say? Um, so I can extend at, through this threshold and speak of this in a regular way, just in the sense that I listed before, that if you take n to zero suitably, suitably regular way, okay? Now here in these coordinates, it's hard to say whether I can take n, which was the square root of this, to zero in a suitably regular way. But if I change to these isotropic coordinates, then the surface, which used to be called r equals 2m as the boundary of my spatial slice, is now the surface s equals m over 2, which is a perfectly regular surface in this manifold. Okay, and I'll draw a picture. So if your usual Schwarzschild spatial slice p equals 0 Schwarzschild looks like this, where r to infinity is here, and r to 2m is this boundary, which is the horizon, which is why everything goes in there vertically. Then in the s-coordinates, actually what happens is I have two copies of this, and then this corresponds to s m over 2. This corresponds to s to infinity, so this is s bigger m over 2, and this is s bigger than zero and less than m over two, and this is s going to zero, okay? So now I have two copies of a spatial slice of Schwarzschild glued together, 
completely smooth through this t equals zero section of the horizon. And the whole thing is conformally flat, as you can see by this formula. Okay? So now in the spatial slice, there is no singularity anymore at all in these coordinates. Of course, the singularity is still there in the space time, and I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be boring again. But in the spatial slice, it's gone. And you can do the same thing with suitable choices. So in high dimensions for M positive in Schwarzschild for what is called sub-extremal Reisner or Nordstrom, um, so a suitable condition between the charge and the mass, and uh, also in higher dimensions, um, and for ADS and ADS uh, Schwarzschild, you can do something similar, but not precisely that. And what you can see in this picture, and which is actually true fully and can be proven rigorously, is that this double is geodesically complete, okay? Spatially geodesically complete. This is just the T equals zero slice. I'll write that over there. And the other thing I want to write down, <coughs> excuse me, is that it's reflection symmetric through the surface S equals M over two. So if you look at this picture, I already tried to suggest it in this picture, you can take something along the lines of an inversion in the sphere, in the surf in the sphere, or something like S going to one over S, but you need to be a little bit more clever than this, um, to take the upper part to the lower part and vice versa, which is why this is a totally geodesic hypersurface. Right. So this is then totally geodesic, and if you don't know exactly what this term means, it means the, it also has vanishing extrinsic curvature. And this curvature I'm going to denote by H. And in particular, it's minimal. This is something you've probably seen in Rick's lecture. So the mean curvature is zero. This is mostly to fix notation. And also, what we've seen is that n of s m over two is zero. So if you're very listening very carefully, you notice that n was a function of r and not of s, and s is now a new coordinate. So I'll write a little twiddle over there, meaning the same function written in a different coordinate variable. Okay, so it's a different formula, but it's the same function. And we, and we won't need the explicit form. 
It will only need that and will be zero there. <coughs> okay, so much for this class of examples that you can have at the back of your mind now that we introduce general static metrics. Before I go there, though, is, are there any questions? Yes. Maybe I should write that that way. That's a good way of saying it. N of R of S and S equals M over 2. Thank you. OK, so here comes the definition. Definition one, the space time r cross mn ds squared i.e. a Lorentzian manifold which is I'm orientable MN is orientable and connected. I'll always unless I say something else, all manifolds will be connected in this in this lecture. Okay. The space time of this form R cross MN with the metric DS squared is called standard static. And most people never use the additional term standard, but still use this definition. If the S squared can be written as, yes? Just connected, doesn't matter. Just not several pieces. Um, the S squared is minus N squared dt squared plus a metric G, where T is the variable in R, N from MN to R, N positive is, is a function called the Lefs function. And G is a Riemannian metric on MN. Okay, so we have this warped, this product manifold, R cross MN, R is the time uh, coordinate, and MN is the spatial manifold, as before. And now we have a term here that looks exactly like before, but our spatial metric G can be more different, can be different from spherically symmetric. And N also doesn't only depend on some radial coordinate, but can depend on the whole spatial coordinate set. But of course, we still want n to be positive. And now g is a Riemannian metric, meaning it's also time independent. And n is also time independent. They're just on mn. They don't depend on t. Okay? That's what's called standard static. And of course, all the examples we've looked at before are of this form. I want n big or equal to three. Um, so why is this called standard static? Let's make a few remarks. So first of all, dt is a time-like killing vector field in the space-time.
And in fact, if you were wondering what the physical meaning is of n, it's the length of dt with respect to the Lorentzian metric. Okay? So we redraw the picture. Then dt is a field here. And also, and this is a more tricky condition to write down, the orthogonal complement of this field dt is Frobenius integrable. That's how the mathematicians would say it. The physicists would say, and this actually means the same thing, dt is hypersurface orthogonal. which in formulas means that dt index alpha, the covariant derivative in the space-time beta, dt index gamma, anti-commute. So this is the vector field dt index alpha, covariant derivative in direction of coordinate beta, Take again the, off the, the vector field DDT in coordinate gamma and cyclic anti-permutation. Okay. So what it really means, if you know nothing about these things, is it means that there is a right angle here. So I can have surfaces of constant time and the vector field DDT is perpendicular to them everywhere. If you think about Kerr, this cannot be done in Kerr. There's no time function on Kerr that does this. The DDT in Kerr is a time-like Killing vector field at least far out away from the black hole, but it's the, this is not Frobenius integrable, or in other words, this is non-zero. So the, 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 the vector field is not perpendicular to the t equals constant slices. And typically, staticity is defined to be static, is defined as just this uh, and this. not what I wrote. This implies that locally it has this form. So let's call this form three. I forgot a number two on the equation for the conformal transformation of Schwarzschild, if you want to add that to your notes, so I can refer to that later. Um, so locally, it has to be of the form ds squared has to be of the form three. <clears throat> but what we're assuming is that this is globally true. That's why it's called standard static. Okay. Typically, people are very sloppy and use these two notions interchangeably, even though they mean global, and they would mean standard static, but they don't say it. So be careful when you read the literature there. And then, also, we can alternatively represent the standard static space-time in 
as a system where it has just the man Riemannian manifold MNG and the function in. And such things are called static systems. So then let's have definition two. We want to talk about black hole uniqueness, so we need to say what a black hole is in this context. So let Mn G N be a static system. And then if n minus 1 sits in Mn uh, in, um, in the boundary of Mn is a, com is a closed surface, so compact surface. And so maybe you're confused. Surface, in, in, if n equals 3, it's a surface. Otherwise, it's a hypersurface. But I'll be sloppy. Um, has um, n restricted to the surface equals zero, where we're implicitly presuming that n extends to the boundary. I'll give an explanation of this in a second. We call it a killing horizon, or the cross section of a killing horizon. So why this? We call the, the lapse function in was the length of a killing vector field. So if n is 0, the killing vector field is at least null or even possibly 0 on the surface, this, which is why it's a surface characterized by the killing vector field. And the surface cannot be inside the manifold, but has to sit in the boundary, because we said the function n has to be positive in the manifold. So then it can only be 0 on the boundary and not inside, because it's positive. Yes. Um, no. So, <coughs> sorry. So if you think about Schwarzschild, um, you have your usual Schwarzschild on which n is positive. It will be zero on, on the horizon. So the horizon is not part of this static system, okay? And then the horizon will be this exactly the surface sigma n minus one, which sits in the boundary of your spatial slice of Schwarzschild. And this, the, the, the t equals zero slice of the killing horizon in the usual sense, okay? Um, and then if the mean curvature h of sigma n minus one in Mn union with the boundary is zero. So if it's a minimal surface, which I'm sure Rick Shane discussed, then 
it's a horizon. It's called an horizon. And if you've heard about marginally outer trapped surfaces or MOTs, this is exactly a MOT here because the second fundamental form of the slice in the space time vanishes. So the part coming in the MOTs from the second fundamental form is not there. If you've never heard about this, ignore the comment. Um, and we will say, let's say sigma n minus one is a static horizon. If n extended to n minus one is zero and h is zero. So both conditions hold true. Then we will call it a static horizon. Is there a question? Does everybody, yes. Does it depend on the coordinates in which I define my metric? No. Yes? <laughs> if a coordinate, if a time function t exists such that you can write it like this, there is no assumption on spatial coordinates, just on the time coordinate, yes. So in some sense, you may be afraid that these conditions are a little bit redundant, and if you assume Einstein equations with suitable matter fields, in some scenarios, if you have vanishing lapse function, you get mean curvature vanishing for free or vice versa, but it depends on the matter. Okay, so in general, it's not redundant. And of course, in order to even say that H is zero here, I need to extend the geometry of the manifold MN to its boundary. So, presuming G extends to sigma n, n minus one as well. So what does this mean again in the Schwarzschild context? Let me draw again this picture. So if this is our MN with metric and lapse function from Schwarzschild, then on this surface, it's a minimal surface, h equals zero, and the lapse function vanishes. But the surface, let me repeat, is not part of the space, which is why it's the boundary of the space. Once we doubled it, this is a nice, smooth, geodesically complete manifold. However, the lapse function, of course, still vanishes on this surface. So this surface cannot be part of the standard static space time because we requested that n be positive. And even worse, while n is positive here, if you reflect n down here, n will be negative here necessarily. Okay, and n equals zero on this surface. So only the upper part of this is a standard static system. Those of you who know what this means, this is the spatial section of the domain of outer communications. Okay, inside here, you're inside the hole, yeah? in a spatial section of being inside the hole. Um, so only here you're in the, stat in the static system. This is a little bit complicated to, to speak about. That's why I'm making sure everybody understands this in the Schwarzschild example. So let me say once more, in the, in the part above and not including the boundary here, not including the minimal surface, we are a standard static system if we add the time direction and the lapse function in correctly to have a space time. On the boundary, we have a horizon because we can smoothly extend both the metric and the lapse function through here. However, the whole thing will not be the spatial slice of a standard static system because n is zero here and negative here, okay?
So if you want to do another example, where did my blue color go? Another exercise? Number four, verify that r equals to m. And I'm writing um, uh, quotation marks because this is not part of the system, is a static black hole horizon. Yes, please. Closed? Oh, no, I'm assuming it's closed. Oh, okay. I'm assuming it's closed and smooth and everything, but we're part of the boundary. And then if the left function, is, if I assume the left function extends smoothly and the metric extends smoothly, and then these conditions hold. And a, and a horizon in the sense of initial data sets. So, now comes a definition you may have seen in a similar form in Rick Shane's lecture, deciding on, uh, de defining the asymptotics. A static system M3 GN, and then, yeah, let's do it in three dimensions here. It's easier. No, we can do it in N. M, N, N big or equal to three is called asymptotically Schwarzschildian. Or also asymptotically isotropic if there exists a number M and R, uh, if MN can be written as a compact set in a disjoint union with a manifold EN, which is called an end, such that EN diffeomorphic to Rn outside some closed ball and Dij look like one plus M over two S four to the four over N minus two delta Ij plus lower order terms and N looks like one minus, oh, sorry, power missing S n minus two, S n minus two plus lower order terms, S s goes to infinity. I, I presume you've seen asymptotic flatness in Rick's lectures. So asymptotic flatness, of course, here you just write delta ij and lower order terms, and lower order in, in Rick Shane's lecture meant lower than even this. So uh, this is in particular asymptotically flat with very, very vigorously prescribed asymptotics. So, um, and of course, to make this precise, I would need to say what I mean by lower order. Oh, sorry, yes? Uh, disjoint union. So there's a compact set and an end that, and they don't have any intersection. Um, so, of course, I would need to make precise what I mean by lower order. Okay, but I won't because it won't matter too much. I will write it in the theorem. And in particular, keep in mind that lower order terms also means derivatives have prescribed behavior. So the, de the first partial derivatives of this also have looked like the first partial derivatives of this plus terms of lower order 
and, and second ones as well, and depending on context, third and fourth ones as well, possibly, okay? So lower order terms can include derivatives. And you will find this in the literature mostly under the name of asymptotic Schwart being asymptotic to Schwarzschild or asymptotically Schwarzschildian. However, I wrote it in S variables because it really looks like the isotropic version of Schwarzschild, and this is not equivalent to being asymptotic to the Schwarzschild spacetime and Schwarzschild coordinates at this order of lower order that we will be talking about. You can perform the same change of coordinates, of course, to transform one into the other, but then you will have a different diffeomorphism here. So be careful, it really should be called asymptotically isotropically Schwarzschild or something like this. And I'm gonna call it asymptotically isotropic throughout. So I'm gonna go, where's green? I'm gonna call it asymptotically isotropic. Now, of course, Rick Shane has introduced the ADM mass, and maybe some of you have already been wondering, at least in three dimensions, does this M have anything to do with the ADM mass? And yes, and N equals three, M is nothing else but the ADM mass of this G in high dimensions too, if you know of higher dimensional notions of ADM mass. And in particular, this means that it's unique. You cannot have the same static system having two different mass parameters for different diffeomorphisms and have these expansions. It's an invariant, not important. And we're gonna call it, of course, the mass of the system. So the last thing I want to talk about today is look at what happens to the Einstein equations. And the Einstein equations, of course, are an equation for general spacetime with matter fields. And if I specify the matter, then it becomes a, a, like a, a clear equation. For example, if I say it's vacuum, the energy momentum tensor vanishes, then it's an equation which equals zero. Okay, so if I have this equation which equals zero and I have a space time of the form where the metric is of the form minus n squared dt squared plus this three metric g or n metric, Riemannian metric g, I can plug in this formula and simplify the equations, okay? So in vacuum, plugging in um, this into Einstein, into the Einstein equations. we obtain the following system, the Hessian of n equals n times the Rigi, where this is with the Hessian with respect to G, and this is the Rigi with respect to G, and the scalar curvature with respect to G vanishes. These are the equations that remain. Scale or flat, and the Hessian of the lapse is the lapse times the Ricci. Now, there are a couple of nice things about this. This equation doesn't involve the lapse at all, and this equation is linear in the lapse. This will be useful later. And together, if you trace the first equation, the Laplacian with respect to G of N vanishes automatically. So N is harmonic necessarily 
as a consequence, if you trace this, it says Laplacian of n is n times scalar curvature, scalar curvature is zero, so Laplacian of n is zero. So n harmonic. Okay. So the last homework exercise for people who want to do homework will be exercise five, verify this. And of course, if you choose another matter model than vacuum, say electrovacuum or something else, a fluid, you will get other equations. They will keep the property, though, that they're all linear in N. Okay? So thanks uh, for today, and I'm taking questions.